Well, that would be a pretty impressive cave to uh, just suddenly appear to everyone's horizon with 400 miles of passage. <laughs> well, that's why, for example, you mentioned your cave at four and a half miles. Well, that's a lot of cave. And people who aren't cavers don't realize this. You know, 400 miles, 412 miles is a lot of cave. And but, you know, five, six, ten miles of cave is a lot of cave connected with, particularly if you look at it compared to Ohio caves. Well, I know the, the cave list. You look, we look at the names and see our cave just slowly creeping up <laughs> yeah. on the list from, from somewhere down, you know, 400 to yeah, now right. we're up in the 290s <laughs> yeah. for, for the United States. So, you know, you, you see that we're, we're making some progress. Sure. Um, tell me something about Phil Smith. Phil Smith uh, is a graduate of the Ohio State University. <coughs> he, uh, he and Roger McClure uh, knew each other in Springfield, Ohio. They hitchhiked down to Crystal Cave one time uh, in probably 1952 or 3. And uh, they were the people who started the Central Ohio Grotto, so they were interested in caves all along. Phil Smith majored in psychology. Uh, I think he was in the ROTC, but at any rate, he became a, uh, interested in polar logistics uh, and uh, science support. Uh, science support mainly is logistics in terms of the Arctic and the Antarctic, that is, Transportation plays a whole lot of time and money in, in connection with those undertakings. And in the course of that, he met lots of different scientists from different disciplines, as well as setting up uh, things like uh, long traverses across the ice. When uh, Bill Austin came back from a trip to the Antarctic, he stopped in New Zealand and he met the inventor of the jet boat. And he brought a jet boat back from New Zealand and was going to become the United States dealer for jet boats. And uh, he thought the way to get the jet boat known was to stage a, uh, a river trip up the Grand Canyon, up the Colorado River, uh, in a jet boat. And uh, nobody had ever tried to go up the Colorado River because of numerous waterfalls and rapids and so on. But he was sure that a jet boat could do it, so he enlisted Phil Smith to set up the logistics for that trip, since you can't get to the Colorado River for the whole course of the Grand Canyon. Uh, and uh, worked out where the supply dumps would be and everything. And during the uh, course of this upriver trip, uh, Bill Austin was the victim of an accident. He came to one of these waterfalls and they spun around and went down and he broke his leg in a couple of places. And Phil Smith arranged the evacuation from the Grand Canyon to some hospital. 
So that was Phil Smith's uh, area of expertise. So he he then became uh, a member of the uh, National Science Foundation and was involved in uh, Washington, D.C. and uh, in a lot of science support. Uh, and then he retired and moved to Texas or someplace and then he died. Uh, he remained a bachelor his whole life and uh, after he left CRF, he became, uh, I wouldn't say estranged from CRF, but he refused to offer what I call <coughs> daily guidance. I visited him a couple of times in Washington, D.C. He had uh, an apartment in the Watergate. And while he read CRF newsletters and so on, he was not centrally involved in that. He was deeply involved in what I call federal science. Yeah. And was widely considered one of the expert science managers. A number of people that were very prominent in the early caving days of the NSS and CRF have just just sort of dropped out besides Phil and did other things. What do you think makes people suddenly just drop out of activities like this? Do they get tired of it? Do they develop new interests? What What is the reason that people stop cave air or well, I think most people stop caving, and uh, our experience was that people would, five years was about what you would get out of a project caver. They would move on and sometimes become cavers elsewhere, uh, but most of the time they dropped out entirely of caving. I think part of it is physical. As people age, they get less flexible, they get less endurance. Uh, we discovered that uh, women cavers have more endurance than men cavers and uh, therefore Cave Research Foundation always encouraged women cavers and has had several CRF presidents as women cavers and uh, counted on them for long trips. <laughs> Uh, that's one of those physical advantages that women cavers have. Uh, but like everybody else, they tend to get interested in other things. Uh, very often there, there are things that, uh, if you read a, a book called Bowling Alone, which has to do with the drift in American society from communal activities away to individual watching television and spectator sports and things which don't involve clubs. The downfall of various clubs, including the NSS, uh, shrinking of membership, I think, is part of this uh, nationwide trend of people away from uh, small group and community activities uh, in, into individual uh, sports and individual forms of uh, entertainment and amusement. So why do people give up caving? Well, I think the answer is they they discover other things. People who are married uh, to a cave fanatic can find that the uh, caving can become an obsession and uh,
to the neglect of family and friends, uh, particularly if one spouse is not interested in caving, uh, there's a tendency to pull the other one away from caving to other things. Uh, the more things there are to uh, attract people in various directions, the, the more you're likely to see any one of those uh, activities uh, shrink, I think, in terms of long-term enjoyment. Uh, I read a book one time on risky undertakings, and uh, one of the most dangerous undertaking is skydiving. And almost anybody who's been in skydiving for five years has broken a, a leg or two or an arm or two or walked into a propeller and been killed. And uh, so the attrition rate in skydiving is very, very high. So as they probably skydiving has a, a shorter longevity than cave exploring. I can't prove that, but I think that's probably true. Because the more skydiving you do and the more dependent you are on other members of your family, the more they're going to argue you to have you stop doing that risky behavior. I was uh, just curious about your thoughts about that. Because, as you say, the NSS is shrinking oh. somewhat. And if you read, I, they had the NSS ballots for all the new candidates for the Board of Governors. Oh. And almost all of them mentioned, what can we do, what we're going to do to try to get the people involved again. And, uh, and I was just, and, and I know you talked about that, uh, about how to keep a project going by recruiting new people. Is, is CRF hanging in there? Is it a shrinking or is it growing? Is it staying about the same? It's probably hard to tell in the middle of COVID. Yes, it's hard to tell exactly, but CRF has a number of projects around and each of those projects has a, a cohort of people who, who see that as their central focus. For example, Lava Beds uh, has a whole bunch of caves and uh, so some of the CRF people from Flint Ridge, Mammoth Cave area, go to Lava Beds but most of the workers are people who live close to the Lava Beds. Now uh, as far as I can tell, if you've seen one lava cave, you've seen them all. <laughs> They're mostly one straight shot from one entrance to another, and uh, and few or no side passages. So those tend to be uh, the kind of cave that after a while you would find that they aren't very interesting anymore. Although the CRF people who go uh, find it a great social time to meet other friends who do that. Now, what can the NSS do? Well, I think the NSS is going to be the victim of television, uh, of, uh, of, uh, cell phones, of, uh, of electronic media where you really don't need the companionship of friends anymore. In fact, if you want to find a mate, why you, the first thing you do is you get an app and you find people who are looking for a mate, see, and uh, you don't go to a dance anymore, you don't have to, you might go to the bar, but after a while I suppose you would find that if you go to the bar you're going to find people who like to drink and uh, maybe if you don't want to 
marry somebody you like to drink who likes to drink uh, that's okay, or if you don't want to marry anybody at all, uh, there's still a lot of ways to do that as a lonely single person. Uh, whereas in the old days, uh, dances were uh, a big community thing. Uh, University and college dances were well attended and so on. I don't know whether they're well attended now or not. I suspect less so. Why is that? Well, because you could look at television and you don't need to go out of your dorm room anymore. Uh, I think movies have dropped off course with COVID-19 uh, people don't know but then movies can be seen on every television set getting closer to the time when they first appear. Black Panther was uh, streaming on television almost immediately after it was released in theaters. That's getting to be more the case so you don't have to go out and you certainly don't have to go out with anybody else. So I think the drift away from socializ uh, socialization, which was what bowling alone identified as the decline and demise of lodges, uh, charitable lodges, uh, the decline of churches and the replacement with mega churches uh, where people are more spectators than uh, than participants in the whole thing uh, well I don't know that I agree with you I think there's been a decline of large group socialization but I don't think smaller activities are affected as much and I think you get socialization uh, over the web talking to people that you just not in person so I think it's changed I don't think it's actually declined like I talk to people in Africa almost every day, Yeah, you know, and if we didn't have the internet, I wouldn't yeah. be following those people. So I, I think the large group socialization has, has diminished, but I, I think friends getting together for dinner or something, yeah. I think that's still a thing. I think friends getting together and going caving is still a thing. Mm -hmm. But the, the big activities are what's declining, but I don't think the small activities, more, more personal activities are, are in decline. And I, I don't know, you could be right. I just, I just don't, I, I, I don't think that the typical characterization of, of the uh, internet stuff is causing people to become more isolated is real, really true because before the internet people would sit at, in places and they'd sit and read the newspaper, sit and read books and I know that there's articles back from the uh, early 1800s maybe when books were becoming more popular is how this was going to destroy culture because <laughs> people are, are won't do any activities because they're going to be spending all their time reading books yeah. and I see almost the exact same thing with people talking about about the I I internet cultures it, how, how it's destroying interpersonal relationships I think people have always to an extent isolated themselves with whatever media was popular and I think that they uh, there's been a, a, a rise and fall of, of large group activities, but I, I, I think the, the, the small groups of people doing things have, 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 have always been the, the, the stalwart of what most personal 
in-person interaction is, and I think that's pretty much stayed the same. I wonder about the NSS. I used to be involved with it when I was going to like Western Kentucky and stuff. I, I go to uh, bog meetings and stuff like that even, you know, go to various get-togethers. But whenever I've been in a group or a grotto, for example, what what seemed to tie the group together, in my opinion, was having this regular newsletter where you could read what what's going on and and what your friends were doing and what discoveries this got ca guy casual guy you knew were doing, and so the newsletters are still being produced, but in the NSS itself, the uh, the news is uh, talks more about big project stuff, uh, the bulletin, it takes you six or seven months to get an article in, yeah. and they're uh, super technical, uh, which is, is fine for a journal, but I, I think that the average caver is, feels that they're being left out of the, the events in, in the, in the NSS news and left out of the, out of the bulletin, and you have the demise of the the, uh, the Spilio Digest, I think, was was a, a, a nice publication because it let people be like citizen scientists. Yeah. The people writing it, they were writing trips about small caves that they were going to or projects that they, right. other people were doing that was of interest to them, something they could see themselves doing. And perhaps we're doing on a more regular basis. And I, I, I just wonder about the, uh, 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 maybe it's a misnomer, but the growing institutionalization of it becoming more and more detached, it seems, from the caving populace in general. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things you had to deal with with the CRF. How, how do you manage all these different people and keep them interested and at the same time trying to be professional at the same time? And it's, it's kind of, kind of a, a balance you had to, had to achieve somehow. See, you may be right. And uh, I guess since my... My only exposure to this is reading this book, Bowling Alone, and there the statistics are overwhelming. I mean, this is not just claiming that uh, lodges and uh, fraternal organizations and so on are shrinking, but the, the data shows they are. This is not illusion, and that's the title of the book is Bowling Alone. Instead of being on a bowling team where you, you now have two or three people going bowling, and maybe they are not a team, maybe they just bowl once every month or two. Uh, so you may be right. I suspect that the, the, the question is more complicated than anybody really knows. Because uh, there are more and more people in the United States than there ever were. Uh, most of those people live closer together than they ever lived before. Most of them find that it's a lot farther to get out of town than it used to be. <laughs> uh, and more expensive to get out of town than it used to be. And in short, the magnets that draw people tend to be things that individuals can enjoy. You know, instead of going to a banquet, uh, which occasionally you could do, uh, there are opportunities to go to a restaurant with two or three friends. In fact, you can go to the restaurant by yourself if you want. So, I'm not sure that 
that discussing this subject is very good unless it's based on data. And uh, the Bowling Alone book was the first time I saw any data on the subject. Although the data on NSS membership is that it's you know, headed down. Uh, I, I'm all for data, but I, I need to understand how the data was collected right. and, and what, what was chosen to be included in their data set and what wasn't chosen to be in included. And I, I can see that these social clubs and that are, are declining. I, I don't have any problem with that. Yeah. I, I just don't know how well that applies to questions of something like like decrease in membership at the NSS for example. Oh well I think or, or on a personal more personal level I, I'm not sure how the data sets apply. Well also what is the NSS? And the answer is I think that 10% of the NSS has always done about 80% of the cave exploring and mapping. And the other 90% has been involved in what I call social activities. Now the numbers that I've given are just guesses off the top of the head, but yeah. may, maybe it's 30% do 70%. Maybe of, it's 10 and 90, or <laughs> yeah. 5 and 95. I have no idea what the number <laughs> is, but I think that part of the appeal of uh, the NSS used to be the, the grotto meeting, and in this case the Dayton Underground grotto has essentially collapsed, collapsed a couple of times. <laughs> Uh, why? Well, they don't have a newsletter. That's one of the things you pointed out. And I think part of the glue that holds it together is a newsletter and communication between people. Uh, some organized caving trips will attract new people and hold people for a while. Uh, but the grotto I belonged to had no organized trips. <laughs> uh, things had deteriorated to the point that the only people who came to meetings were a few old friends. And uh, it was uh, maybe once every couple of months somebody new would appear and want to go caving and uh, People were always too busy to go with them. <laughs> so my experience is uh, kind of limited to this grotto. I, I think the Connecticut grotto, on the other hand, Central Connecticut grotto, is, is alive and well. I don't know that, but from reading their newsletter, that's, I would say it was a going grotto. They have a nice Facebook page. They have regular stream meetings of their uh, streamed on the web. Yeah. Uh, they have guest speakers come and talk to them. Sure. And uh, and so of of a like like of a web presence for a grotto, they've yeah. got one of the best in the it yeah around. You know, it's, it's yeah. Well, that's uh, but I. That's the exception to my perception, you see. Uh, and then there are parts of the NSS that appeal to uh, some cavers and not others. The old timers reunion, for example, is uh, widely known as a drunken uh, uh, extravaganza of uh, nude swimming and heavy drinking and uh, so on. Uh, I've never been to one of those, not because I'm a prude, but I, I just have always enjoyed going in the cave and 
and uh, surveying and finding things and talking about that. And uh, I've not been interested in the Hoopi and Wahoo activities. So does that represent 10% of the NSS or 50% or 70, I don't know. But the people who are not attracted by that don't do that. I mean, we discovered in CRF pretty early on that we either had to train new people or find exceptional cavers who gravitated to wanting to work on a project and work seriously over a period of time, that is a, a long duration involvement. Uh, and that's not most cavers. Most cavers didn't want to do that. They, they didn't even want to survey, really. Most cavers don't want to survey caves. Why? Well, it's slow. <laughs> you get cold. Uh, if you go to any place interesting, it's too muddy and too wet. Uh, I've always kind of enjoyed surveying because when you're surveying you get to spend see, some time in some place and you can see, see little it. details that you would just blow by if you're a recreational. Right, I okay. observed observe that myself. One of the reasons I like to survey is you see the cave. Um, I'm going to feed the dogs and then I'm going to suggest that we go to dinner. That sounds good, Roger. Uh